You're listening to the Better Angels Podcast. I'm John Wood Jr. special episode for you today, an interview between Miss Lexi Hudson and Mr. David Blankenhorn. Lexi Hudson, Alexandra Hudson, is a former special assistant to Education Secretary Betsy DeVos. She's a fabulous writer whose work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Examiner, and Quillette, and a familiar face and figure in the depolarization and heterodox movement. She's somebody we much love and admire here at Better Angels. And she had an interview that she conducted with Better Angels founder and president, David Blankenhorn, a little after the 2018 midterm, which for some reason didn't see the light of day until now. But it's something very much worth listening to. They have a wide-ranging conversation about polarization, what it takes to create a healthy civil society, but also explored David Blankenhorn's personal experiences in the crosshairs of the culture wars. I won't spoil it, but now I give you... So much for being here today, David. And David Blanket. Great to be talking to you. Been looking forward to it. Yes, yes. Um, So I'd love to hear a little bit about um, what prompted you to start Better Angels to begin with, and kind of the timeline around that, and what were you doing before? Love to hear your story. Yeah. I started a think tank in the late 80s called Institute for American Values, and it was a We were studying civil society, particularly the role of families in our civic life, and I did that for a long time. And in working on that, you know, it was important to bring liberals and conservatives together. So there was a sense of caring about working across difference in that work. Um, In the early 2000s, I became involved in the gay marriage debate, first as a you know, I was a fairly prominent opponent of gay marriage. I was in the media a lot, and I testified in the Prop 8 trial in California, which was the big gay marriage uh, case um, uh, at the time. And then about a year or so later, I actually changed my opinion on it. I wrote an article in the New York Times about it, and because I had been in the limelight on the issue, it caused a, a, that caused a bit of a ruckus, and it put me in the spotlight Again, I think I might be one of the few people in the country that was strongly and vociferously criticized by both sides on the gay <laughs> marriage issue. Hmm. So that gave me a little bit of a personal taste of when when the when disagreements are that heated, um, just how heated it can be. And then, um, oh, and did I forget to add that blew apart my organization that I'd really? put 25 years into, just kind of put an end to it, really. Wow. Um, the, everybody was mad. The board, Everybody was mad. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. So after a little bit of um, soul searching, and I, I began to think about <clears throat> what could be done about the issue of polarization more broadly and so a day after the 2016 elections, uh, I called my good friend David Lapp from South Lebanon, Ohio, and uh, that county had just voted six, 70% for Trump. And I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and you just would need a search warrant to find anybody who voted for <laughs> Trump. So we began talking about things, and we decided um, that – And we said that, you know, the two sides had had spent a lot of time talking about each other, but had spent almost no time in the campaign talking actually with each other. So we decided to put together a a weekend workshop in South Lebanon. We met in a community center, and we had 10 people who had just voted for uh, Donald Trump and 10 people who had just voted for Hillary Clinton. We met together over the course of the weekend to see if we could, I guess... um, kind of recognize the humanity of the other, mm-hmm. uh, we have, you know, do we have anything to say to one another except, you know, I don't like you, or mm-hmm. I can't imagine how you could possibly have voted for fill in the blank. Mm-hmm. 
So it was just a great experience, and that was really the beginning of Better Angels. Um, we do these things all over the country now. Well, sometimes we do 20 in a week of these workshops. Um, we've done hundreds of them now, and we've gotten thousands of people involved um, as members of Better Angels. And, um, and the goal really is to bring the two, we call them red and blue, the goal is to bring people from the two sides together for these face-to-face meetings where um, they kind of try to refine trust in one another as human beings, as citizens, and look for some things in common mm-hmm. where, we, where we can find them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we we give them the opportunity to continue to work together after those meetings. And so um, our goal is to be kind of a civic force for a new way of thinking about politics in the country where we decide that we might actually work together um, for something rather than just keep descending ever more deeply into the uh, this really poisonous culture of mutual hatred and even violence now uh, on some days. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so that's the goal. The goal is to be a broadly based citizens force for a less polarized country, um, bringing together these two sides. And, um, yeah, it's, it's exciting. It's the most exciting thing I've ever done. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And you're all volunteer apart from the better angel staff, which I think is just a few, uh, like a dozen or so people. Yeah. There's four staff, better angel staff. Four full time staff. Oh my goodness. But you're, so you're primarily volunteer driven then. Is that right? Almost all volunteer. Um, our top organizer, what we call the lead organizer in charge of the workshops is a volunteer. The person who designed the workshops, uh, uh, professor, um, Doherty, is that right? Doherty. Yeah. He's a volunteer. Um, our C, our COO, uh, who just joined us, who was a top manager at Microsoft. Wow. Well, pro bono volunteer. So we are, we are a, um, the organization is run by a lot of volunteers assisted by a very small paid staff. And what that helps us do is, um, you know, we can scale the organization now. We can be active in all 50 states, and we don't have to have millions and millions of dollars to do it. Mm-hmm. So it's been a um, – and it's been wonderful. People have come to us. We don't really – in some ways, we don't even have to recruit. I mean, people just are very, there's a hunger in the country for this. Not everybody, but many, many people think this is important. And they, they come forward and they want to be involved. Right. Yes. Um, that that reality, that truth was particularly um, made clear to me when I read through the Hidden Tribes report. I don't know if you've heard of that recently. Yeah, it a, sure. I, yeah. I learned about it through a race, recent uh, David Brooks column, um, but it uh, it basically um, talks about how most, and it illustrates how most of our dialogue in, in our in our country is, is um, dominated by two fringe extremes, um, on the left and on the right, which total around you know 12 percent of the country's population and how the rest of the country falls into the category the you know 86 84 percent called the exhausted majority they may lean left they may lean right they're not by any means like mushy middle convictionless people but they just they recognize there's more to life and they they, and they're 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 um averse and exhausted by the, the rancorous tenor of our discourse and are looking for ways to heal it. And I think that explains why there is this this hunger for, for organizations and this appetite um, to, to support organizations like Better Angels that are, are doing yeah, this important service. I think so. I mean, when we do, uh, when we ask people to tell us what they take away from the, these meetings, they all, they, a very common thing is we're less divided. We, what we learned is we're less divided than we've been told. Right. So they, so if you just see things on the media and you hear the loudest voices, you would think that we're these two alien groups uh, that have nothing to do with one another. And but when you actually start talking together, you realize that's not that's not true for most people. Right. Um, the extremes, uh, the loudest voices do dominate. The media incentivize those voices and mm-hmm. promote those voices for reasons that 
have nothing to do with journalistic integrity. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, those voices tend to be more, um, you know, the more educated you are and the more higher you are in the socioeconomic structure, the mm-hmm. more polarized you are. Mm-hmm. So the people who have a disproportionate access to the public microphone tend to be the the most polarized Americans. Right. Right. And how political activism is to some extent a privilege. You know, people who are disenfranchised don't have that voice. They have, they have, you know, unfortunately, like other things to worry about, like feeding their kids and, you know, working yeah. multiple jobs. And Yeah. Um, yeah. It, yeah. It's really true. The other thing, Lexi, I've noticed with this is, you know, um, Sometimes when people are involved in civic activity, sometimes the feeling is, you know, this is important for the country and I'm doing my duty and uh, I, you know, like serving on the jury, you know, you you kind of need to do this because your country Mm -hmm. needs this. And that's all true in this case. But the other thing about really rediscovering the fact that you feel some bond of affection with people you don't agree with, it it really lights up all the pleasure centers in your brain. I mean, it's a rush. You, right. you enjoy it. It's a good feeling. Right. Because we are not only hardwired for um, conflict and uh, group formation, we're also hardwired for connection and for a feeling of civic friendship. I mean, we this is a basic human need. And when you when you when people feel that they don't have that anymore with their fellow citizens and you give them this opportunity, they like it and they want more. Exactly. So we've, we've not, it's, we don't have to persuade people of this. You know, right. We don't have to come, Oh, you know, please, please, please. People want this. Exactly. And so that's been really gratifying to see. Yes. It's, it's encouraging. It just, it shows that, you know, because most people like fall into the exhaustive majority category, the, the vast majority that is encouraging as we think about the future. Uh, what, what does that hold? People are hungry enough for change, I think. And, and maybe we've hit rock bottom. Maybe we haven't in terms of the state of our, our civil discourse. But, um, I think that there is that appetite there. You're absolutely right. And, and I, yeah. I, sh- I should have uh, mentioned that, uh, the, the, the name of, of Better Angels derives from uh, Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address. Uh, right. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it is it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory will swell when again touched, as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature, which nature, which he delivered when the country was on the precipice of a civil war. You know, the most divided moment in our our history, our young history yes. of the country. Yes. Um, and he called us to have this, uh, you know, this higher, more noble motive. Um, and I think that's what makes a good leader. And that's what makes Lincoln such an ecumenical figure in our, in our nation that he, you know, he, he did bring out the best on both of us. He called us yeah. to, to, to be better and to see the best in both sides. Um, even, even on a, on an issue as deeply immoral and unjust as, as, as owning other persons as property. Um, yeah. it still yeah. wasn't worth it to him to cut, to cut loose half the country, um, yeah. over that. I'd love to hear more about the name on that point, how you came to that name. So please go ahead. It seemed perfect. You know, um, I mean, what a great couple of sentences you just read. And as you say, it was on the eve of the civil war. So his call to, um, his call to look for the, it failed, you know, um, shortly after he gave that address, the shooting started at Fort Sumter and uh, mm-hmm. half a million Americans were uh, engaged in slaughtering one another for the next four years. So, um, but a um, couple of the most in beautiful and important sentences ever uttered by an American president um, mm-hmm. really uh, calling on us to, find our better selves, even under such difficult and dangerous circumstances. An an interesting thing about that address is that William Seward, who was his Secretary of State, um, wrote the first draft of that sentence for Lincoln, and it it said um, that we call on the guardian angel of the nation Hmm. to help us. Hmm. And 
Lincoln changed it to the to the words that you read. Mm-hmm. You see, he, you can see him marking out Seward's on the draft and adding his own words. But what was interesting is that in Seward's version of things, you were kind of looking outside yourself and asking some pr- external presence, the mm-hmm. guardian angel, to to help in this time of need. In Lincoln's version, you looked inside yourself. We looked at we you know we didn't look outside us we looked in inside us to find our better selves both north and south yeah. it mm-hmm. was so, so moving you know and it turned wow. what would have been a more or less formulaic statement that people have heard many times to something very profound that has really um it continues to mean a lot uh, to me certainly and to many people to this day yes that's so powerful wow um, yeah, it's, uh, it is an interesting moment we find ourselves in where it often feels unprecedentedly divided and rancorous. Um, but I mean, the more and more I, I love history, I'm a lifelong lover and student of history of the path, the wisdom of the past. And, um, the more I study history and specifically American history, the more I appreciate that, um, it, it, it's kind of always been this way, you know? I think it's easy to, for us to think that our current moment is the worst because we're feeling it most sensitive. We're most sensitized to our current moment. It's like, it's the, what we live every day. Right. But, and we weren't, we weren't around during the Civil War. We weren't around during the founding era. We weren't around during the, the Civil Rights era. And so, um, I, um, but, or at least I wasn't. <laughs> um, and so uh, just thinking about how our, our history is rife with, revolutions and, and duels and tarring and feathering and uh, ad hominem attacks and, and we can we can look like from from our greatest leaders too and yeah. and yeah. Um, and what is, what does that what does that mean um, like there will always be people probably that have are, are willing to achieve their goals at any cost and are willing to depersonalize dehumanize um, people that they disagree with to achieve a greater goal that sort of kind of yes. consequentialist, apocalyptic thinking. And um, one, one really interesting um, era uh, that I, I'm actually reading about currently, I don't know if you know Stephen Carter. He wrote a, a, he's a professor at Yale. He was my uh, husband's law professor, actually, for his evidence class, I think. But, uh, yeah, I know him. Oh, yeah. you do? Yeah. yeah. And so I'm reading his book called Civility. That's and a he, great book. Yeah. Yes. I know him and his wife, Anola, they're friends. Yeah. Really? Um, yeah. We'd be fun to interview him sometime. But yeah, he's uh, good. He's a great guy. Yes. He, uh, he writes about the Congressional Bipartisan Civility Summit. I'm, I'm kind of brutalizing the name, but that's essentially what it was in 1990 where the whole idea was let's get our leaders in the same room and have a conversation. And by many accounts, it was successful just trying to get people that disagreed on policy to sit down and have face-to-face conversations and, you know, reignite those bonds of affection. Um, And I mean, I think Better Angels has the alternative perspective where it seems like our leaders don't have that appetite or will to do that right now. And so we're going to the grassroots. We, I, I'm saying we, as in I'm on the better angels team, but like we are, that's our, that's our, our mandate. No, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I think we're at a point now where the reform does have to start with the, with the citizens, you yes. know, we, the people, but, but we ultimately do want to involve our political leaders in this and our leaders in the media and education and, um, but yeah, I do think it's better in this case to 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 um, to start with the grassroots. Um, the, the the leadership institutions are in such uh, breakdown and failure. You know, I don't know what you thought about the Kavanaugh hearings, but it was a you know the nomination and ultimately confirmation of Judge Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court was was just one of the most searing moments yes. Yes. Uh, in many, many decades of divisiveness and polarization in the country. And no matter which side you were on, mm-hmm. people really, I mean, people were deeply, deeply distressed mm-hmm. by this on both sides. And yes. I think what, 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 what distressed me the most was the really disgraceful spectacle of the Senate committee not functioning the way the founding fathers 
envisaged. I mean, um, it was really clear if you listen to the hearings that the two sides were not, there were, there was no communication between them Hmm. uh, of any kind. Mm -hmm. They only, they only heard what the other side was doing by reading about it in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And so they would say, well, we did this. And there was, we didn't know. Mm -hmm. So, so often during those hearings, I felt like saying, you know, you should have no witnesses. Mm-hmm. Just send them all home. Why don't you just actually talk to one another for a few minutes and see what happens? Right. And maybe you could start serving the country rather than treating us to this absolutely disgraceful spectacle right. of, of, of a branch of our government that cannot function in the, in the, in the interest of the people. And that aside from who, you know, Leaving aside for a moment whether you did or didn't want the guy to become on the Supreme Court justice, I'm just talking about the inability of our institutions to function in a way that um, the, the two parties are even communicating with one another. Mm-hmm. And so, I, I don't, <clears throat> I don't have high hopes at the moment for our political leaders to do much more than put their finger to the wind on this and to follow their right. current patterns. Yes. Um, but on the other hand, um, I hope now coming out of these midterms that there can be some changes for the good. But I do think the people have to demand it. I think the people have to begin to model it themselves and how right. we lead our civic lives and then invite the, invite the leaders to sort of join us, you know, like exactly. we're able to do it. Yes. You know, we don't agree with each other, but we actually talk to one another mm-hmm. and Perhaps you could try that. <laughs> exactly. People always claim they they'd like to see better behavior models. They would like um, at our at their federal level and and heal a divided America. But it starts with us. It starts with um, a change in our own hearts and how we interact with our fellow citizens. Yeah, but I mean, both are important, and you want these institutions to change their rules. And um, I, I can think of five or six things I would like for the Senate Judiciary Committee to do differently next time they have a a nominee to consider. But I I don't really see them doing it until there's, um, until they feel that there's a kind of a wave of um, organized support for these changes Mm -hmm. from the voters. Right. Right. The thing I found most interesting about the Kavanaugh hearings and the whole situation was the, the like hard evidence was sufficiently vague and ambiguous. It almost turned out to be a Rorschach test of sorts where you looked at it and you saw a kind of a mirror of yourself, a mirror of like your values and your, and your preferences. And I think that explains so much of, um, like the vociferous debate over something where there was so little tangible, you know, effectual evidence to, to, to grab onto to some extent. Um, yeah, I think a lot of it became, uh, Jay, yeah, just what you say, um, kind of set of symbols for people in some ways. And, um, and I, I, I really, I, I think just the disgraceful way that it was handled, yes. exploited and mishandled uh, uh, in a way that was almost guaranteed to bring out the worst in everyone. Right. Um, I don't think I heard a single sincere question asked. Right. I, I, not one. I don't think I heard a single question to anyone that was a sincere question. Everyone's mind was already made up. Oh, well, they were just, you know, like, tell us a little bit more about what I want you to say now, you yeah. know, uh, leading questions, grandstanding, um, you know, completely transparent opportunities for speech giving, no interest at all in mm-hmm. actually eliciting information in the way that you would want if you really were curious about it. Right. And um, so I thought it was just shameful, right. shameful, shameful, shameful. And uh, we, we shouldn't have ever, ever have another one like that. Right. Um, I, so Chuck Grassley was interviewed for the Wall Street Journal weekend interview spot, um, kind of right around this time uh, that the Kavanaugh hearing was going on. And it didn't go into this too deeply, but uh, it, it, it's pretty well established that Chuck Grassley and Diane Feinstein have a very 
civil and mutually ben- like beneficial and respectful like relationship for being so diametrically opposed ideologically and you know being leaders on for their respective parties and it was so funny that the interviewer asked him directly you know has d- did the way that Diane Feinstein handled the 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 evidence and and Ford's testimony you know kind of dragging it out and you know, leaking it before the media when Ford didn't want to, to kind of create this spectacle that it didn't have to be, he, 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 that the interviewer asked, did, did that affect your personal relationship? And it was so sweet. Like he wanted to give her the benefit of the doubt. He's like, I don't think she would have done that. I don't think that she did. That's probably not, you know, what happened. I'm sure there's more to the story. And, yeah. and it was so endearing because it's like, we don't, we don't do that for people. What is it about this sort of underlying like, subterranean cynicism throughout American public discourse where we, we, don't, we, we don't have any bonds of affection. We don't have any reason to give people the benefit of the doubt or, or see people's views and perspectives to hear them with a charitable, a, a charitable her, hermeneutic. Um, and it's, it's true. I'll just only say, however, yes. a little pushback on this. Yes. If Grassley has such warm feelings toward her, why didn't why weren't they talking at all about anything? Right. I mean, why was there no communication between them at all of any kind? Right. And so, and why did the Republicans on the committee act just as egregiously as the Democrats about pontificating and speech giving as opposed to actually asking anybody a serious question? So I thought that while I, I, I mean, it's just my opinion, but I thought that it was a universally shameful performance right. by everybody involved. So it was definitely a low point, a low point for our country. <laughs> I don't think anyone disputes that. It's just heart heart wrenching. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Although, you know, you you make you make an interesting point. Sometimes these people are able to maintain cordial in friendly private relationships. Who who are the two Supreme Court justices? Um, oh. Uh, Scalia uh, and uh, was it Kagan? I, I think so. Who couldn't? They didn't agree on anything, but right. they had very friendly personal relationships. So right. that was um, that. And you know, short about the time you mentioned 1997 about the uh, conference they had in Washington. At the same time, the leaders on both parties were encouraging their members not to fraternize with each other. Newt Gingrich, when he became Speaker of the House in um, the mid-90s, he actually told his people, do not stay in Washington over the weekends, because if you do, you are likely to encounter these enemy people socially, and you will become friendly with them, and that is very, very bad. You're kidding. (laughs) So he said, go back to your district, tell them that you don't care about Washington, you don't want to be in Washington, you think Washington is the problem, you just want to be back here with the good folks who sent you here, and the last thing on earth you're going to do is fraternize with Democrats. Wow. And and they, you know, they largely took his advice, and now people will tell you in the Congress that whereas, you know, even 20 years ago, there was a kind of cordiality. These people would talk to one another now they basically hate each other and um don't want to don't want to have anything to do with one of course there are exceptions of course there are exceptions but um a lot of people have told me that they don't want to be there anymore i mean it's such an unpleasant place and you know it's kind of like a lot of good people are being driven no not being driven out but a lot of good people are leaving public service because of the level of rancor so um anyway um wow it's important to it's it i i don't know how long we can continue acting this way without really doing really serious damage to our democracy Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i know as a history of student a history a student of history that the real indicator that you're on the precipice is when people start to harm each other, you know, physically, right. with violence. And right. we are now seeing instances of politically motivated violence, bombs and people being driven out of rest, you know, people being told they can't, you know, 
go to a play or go to a restaurant or being hounded and right. people being shot at when they, you know, want to play a basketball, football, baseball game. And, right. You know, I mean, it's, it's isolated yeah. instances still, but when these start happening with more and more regularity, you know, you begin to, wow, we are walking up to the point of treating one another with violence. Mm-hmm. No, that's absolutely right. And I think whenever we see instances of um, politically motivated violence, the conversation invariably shifts to violence in our civil discourse or, or uncivil discourse, our, our, right. our, our violent rhetoric. Because, I mean, even with these two absolutely unconscionable instances with the Pittsburgh shooting and uh, the mail bomber, I mean, both both of them had been spite had had like in, inhuman, unconscionably disgusting, vile, anti-Semitic, hateful rhetoric online. Yeah. And in the, like a friend of mine actually was directly threatened, like it is life threatened to um, by by uh, Cesar the the mail bomber, and really? about 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 wow. a year ago, yes, over something else it was on the immigration topic, and I mean I, I two, there are two interesting takeaways from from that. Firstly, uh, the mail bomber, um, his his rhetoric definitely predated the president. I think people want to want to attribute, maybe give give the president too much blame or too much credit for um, his his condemnable actions. But he was a spiteful and horrible person before Donald Trump. So right. I think right. that's really important to to keep in mind. Um, so a lot of our problems, I think, do predate 2016. Um, secondly, as I mentioned, the conversation invariably shifts from uh, shifts after political violence to uh, violent rhetoric. And I think that's important. It is so important to think about the way in which words are powerful. They're not harmless. Um, right. But then from a legislative perspective, like, does that mean we have to censor or ought to censor all violent rhetoric because it's it's not the case at all. We have lots of metaphors in our in our language that don't always mean I'm going to physically harm you, um, but it just it. I think that the reality and we and we have the First Amendment that that prohibits right. you know censorship of speech, and so it is kind of a a balancing act, and and I think it comes down to individuals taking captive how they use this freedom of speech that is so so precious it is it is a we have the freest system of expression in the entire world and that's something we should be proud of but it means that there we have a responsibility to use it well because the more and more frequently people correlate free speech um, with political violence there's going to be more and more calls to curb it and we've right. already we've already seen those calls and so um just you yeah. know back to this tendency to reactionarily um, kind of overcorrect on when, when horrible atrocities happen. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm with you on that. I, I think in terms of trying to censor speech, that's a cure that's worse than the disease. Right. Uh, but people have to do this voluntarily, and they have to. It, uh, speaking with decency to one another is a sub-legal norm if you can't legislate it. Um, you can have rules, you can have customs, but not laws, really. That's um, right. So, um, yep. isn't it interesting, though, that, you know, for the, now, the, the most, I think the most common verb used in politics today is fight. Really? Everybody, yeah, everybody's fighting for something. I'm fighting for you. I'm fighting for the average family. I'm fighting for something. You know, whatever we're all so I can't I, the more I hear this the more I keep saying well who are these people you're fighting if we're all fighting who are the people you're fighting mm -hmm. and the the only answer is you're fighting certain of your fellow citizens mm -hmm. that can only be what you're fighting mm -hmm. you can't you can't be really fighting a building no you're 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 fighting we're fighting each other and so um I I agree with you that if if when we use our or the war our the use of the term war, where mm -hmm. it, where the war on women, the war on drugs, the war on terrorism, where everything's a war. Mm -hmm. um, so if everything's a war and everything that we think is important, we're fighting over. I don't know. It, it, I think we should choose different words to talk about the intensity of our feelings. Right. Yeah. 
Um, speaking of in, in intensity of feelings, I, uh, I have to, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about uh, any thoughts you have on the election, uh, elections last night, rather, the midterms. Um, any interesting takeaways or have you kind of, yes. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you the same thing. <laughs> um, well, still absorbing it, of course. I guess a little of it depends on what you think the country is most in need of right mm -hmm. now. No. I mean, if what you think the country is most in need of is your side beating the other side at the polls, if that's the main thing, then I think yesterday's results are kind of mixed mm -hmm. for you. You know, the, the Democrats um, regained control of the House. Um, the Republicans increased their majority in the Senate. Uh, there wasn't a wave in either direction. There wasn't a decisive statement from the people in one way or another. Um, the change you see in the midterm after a, president is, a new president comes into office was consistent with how this tends to work out historically. So, um, so if, the, if, if you think that the main thing the country needs, in your opinion, is that your side is the victor, then... I would think you would have to say the results are mixed. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there's reason to feel good and reason to feel bad on both sides. Mm -hmm. But what if the main thing that's on your mind in terms of what the country needs is for the two sides to hate each other less and to begin to work together for the good of the country? Mm -hmm. What if that's the main thing? Then I think you, and that's the way I look at it, more than which side wins is can we begin to repair our institutions and our ways of thinking about each other so that we don't just continue down this road of just rancor. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's it, I think you just have to say it depends on what we all do now. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, um, you can imagine things getting worse um, or you could imagine things getting better. There are a lot of new people coming into office. Um, there are um, some interesting ballot initiatives at the state level last night that kind of went against what you might predict in terms of polarization. There are a lot of the new office holders are women. Let's see if that makes a difference. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there, you know, it just depends. Um, now, you can imagine things getting a lot worse. Um, you can imagine the Democrats in the House spending all their time investigating president Trump and impeaching him. And then you can imagine the response on the, or the Republicans deciding that, um, Nancy Pelosi is, a uh, just Satan responsible for every horrible thing that has ever happened and will ever happen again. Hmm. And demonizing her, you can imagine all that happened, mm -hmm. um, but you could also imagine it not happening. You could imagine people rising to some kind of higher level and trying to work together a little bit more um, in a divided government. So I don't know. To me, it seems like let's see if we can't tilt things toward a positive direction. Right. You know, um, because there, there's nothing preordained about this. Mm-hmm. Um, Pope John Paul II used to say, I love this line. I don't know. I think it's a translation, of course. But he said, he said, history is not a preordained process, but is an event in freedom. Hmm. You know, it's what we do. We're free to do it. We're free to, we're free to be, we're free to act. We mm -hmm. don't have to follow some script that's being set in advance uh, prior. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to think of it that way. Yeah, that's beautiful. So let's. Let's take this result from yesterday and see if all these new people and new voices can't do a little better for us right. than their predecessors. Right. Yes. Agreed. I, uh, I was encouraged, though, by the incredibly high turnout 
Um, that was something I sensed. I didn't look at any kind of predictions, uh, but I said to my husband last night and I sent an email the night yet last night too to vindicate me, uh, to a friend that I thought I just, I, I don't remember. I haven't been around for very many elections, but, um, I, I feel like it was two dozen times a day that I would be bombarded with encouragements, admonishments to, to go vote. And I don't remember it ever being so yeah, sensing that urgency. I've never, I've never quite seen it like that before. Did you feel that too though? Yes. Uh, you know, to be honest, I had mixed feelings about it too, because on the one hand, of course, voting is really important. And the more voters we have going out to the polls, the better. Um, but there was a kind of a, um, the feelings about Trump pro and con seemed to dominate so much, especially in the media, that there was a, almost a kind of a frenzied nature about it. Mm -hmm. That no matter what happened, it couldn't possibly be as apocalyptic or as, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. I felt myself thinking from time to time, maybe just to be contrary, I felt myself thinking in the last few days when everybody said that the world will absolutely end, stop on a dime, unless such and such happens in the midterms. I just felt myself thinking, you know, there's so many things in life more important than politics. That's true. I can name 25 things that are much more important to me than politics. Yes. And um, so I don't know. Uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah, I mean, of course, the turnout was great. Yes. And, the, and that was really a good sign for our democracy. Yeah, it was a good day for democracy. I had, I had the, so, I had, I had the, New yeah. York, the New York Times numbers say it was 114 million uh, votes cast for the House uh, last night compared to 83 million in 2014, last midterm. Okay, wow. So, yeah, quite a significant uh, yeah. difference. Yeah. But what I, found, what I found interesting about that, um, you know, I, I think like you're right to be optimistic on one hand that that there is some fresh blood in in, um, in the Senate and House and and we can be hopeful that that might change the flavor and the tenor a little bit. Right. Um, but just but there were there wasn't like a radical sweep any one way. Uh, it wasn't which, a wave election. That's right. It wasn't that's a right. Decisive voice from the people saying yes or no to to either philosophy. And what's interesting about that is we had an incredibly high turnout compared to last midterm with very similar results, which maybe says, you know, to, to the work that uh, you and I are doing, there, there might be more of a challenge ahead of us. Like the divisions are more widespread and more pervasive than, than we thought. The fact that there are more people turning out and, and, and the, the vote didn't quite, didn't quite change. What do you think about that? Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, it's interesting if you ask people, do they think we've gone off the rails in terms of treating each other so badly and in terms of loss of civic trust and everybody just shouting and screaming all the time in politics? Are they heartbroken and think that's really bad? Really large majority say yes, they do. Um, but then, as you say, you know, the, the, our political system just seems to become more and more polarized and the more and more extreme candidates um, um, are favored now on both sides. I, I think for a while it was the Republicans who were more frequently nominating candidates on the extreme and now I think it's it's balancing out you know because there are a lot of my Democratic friends will say things like well we tried being nice but now we've really got to buckle down and get in the mud just like they do, you know? Right. And, um, and I've had uh, some of my conservative friends now said, especially after the Kavanaugh hearings, there's no talking to these people. They'll, they'll do anything. There's no talking to them. I'm, 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 I've given up on trying to talk. I mean, yes. it's now it's just time to strap in and fight. Right. And so, um, I don't know if it's possible for both things to be going on at the same time. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't quite know what to make of it. That they're they're on the one hand, the system seems to be increasingly polarized. On the other hand, there do seem to be a majority of Americans who are really unhappy with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, right. 
let's choose to believe yes. <laughs> that the most important thing is that a majority of Americans or many, many millions of Americans would like us, that would like us to find our better selves when it comes to how we treat each other politically. That's right. I, I'm pretty sure that is really true, that many, many millions of Americans are heartbroken by what's happened and mm -hmm. would sincerely like to find something better. And the reason I know it is because I do see it in our work. Mm -hmm. um, people um, are eager for it. And when they get it, they're really happy about it. Makes them feel better, makes them feel more optimistic about their country, makes them feel more optimistic about their neighbors, makes them less depressed. They feel less isolated. They, their, the blood temperature, the blood pressure goes down a drop. You know, they're not angry at all as angry and fearful as they were. So mm -hmm. people want these things and they're not, by and large, not getting them from the political system right now. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting though, that, that sort of rhetoric that you recounted some of your friends saying about just can't deal with the other side anymore. They, they can't be reasoned with. They, they're willing to do anything. So we have to be willing to do anything too. That's, you know, reminiscent of a lot of what our public leaders say today, um, whether it's Hillary Clinton's comments just a few weeks ago that you can't be civil with uh, with a party with whom you disagree with. Um, and that's also what some of the uh, more skeptical uh, members of Congress said around the civility summit at, in Hershey, Pennsylvania, that we were just talking about in the late nineties. Right. They, many of them boycotted it. They're like, no, we're not going to go to that. Like it's not, it's not worth it. The other side cannot be dealt with. They cannot, they're not worth, you know, trying to reconcile. They're not in, uh, they're not in good faith. That's right. Uh, That's they're right. Not in good faith. I have a lot of, you know, a lot of conservative friends who've said to me, um, well, um, liberals, think with their emotions they, they they for them it's all about the emotions and for us it's about using reason and facts i can't tell you how many i lot, lots and lots of people say that and then um uh i saw paul krugman's column the other day from the other side i don't know if you saw it he you know what he, he basically said that there, you cannot be an honorable republican anymore wow. you cannot be a person of integrity and be a republican that back in the old days you could actually be a member of the Republican Party and be someone of honor and decency, but that's no longer true. Right. So every Republican now is a person who has no, who has no decency in them. Mm -hmm. And he, he more or less, I mean, he didn't imply that. He, he just wrote a whole article about why that was true. So, and he's probably the same person that would condemn, you know, President Trump. <laughs> Call, you know, allegedly call, calling all all you know Mexicans rapists, which he got a he, lot of flack for, right? Would, like he would be the first person to, to condemn that kind of categorical, sweeping, broad ugly, sweeping judgment. Yeah, generalization. I'm not trying to pick on Paul Krugman, but I'm just saying that on both sides you have that kind of um, you can see examples of that kind of um, yeah, the way you put it, categorical thinking. That's Everybody right. in this category is just beyond. You That's know, just right. Beyond. And once you start thinking that way, um, you can't. Why? Why? Uh, why reason with? Why reason with anybody? That's I right. Mean, the, the philosophers tell us that it's really the only reason that we don't solve everything by violence. Mm -hmm. no. I mean, if I if you have something I want, if I want your money or if I want your house or if I want your woman or your man, why wouldn't I just kill you and take it? Right. Why wouldn't I? Really? Mm -hmm. um, that's been a common. That's <laughs> history is more or less made up of those instances. Mm -hmm. And uh, why don't we do it? And it ultimately has to do with something. That in our religious tradition we would call recognizing the, um, the the human dignity of the other, recognizing that we're all made in the image of God. In the secular term, it would be you know the, the Kant's categorical imperative that there's something the ethical meaning of things is to treat you like I would want you to treat me. Right. And unless you believe that, unless you have some way of getting at the sacredness and the humanity and the fundamental likeness of the other. Yes. There's no particular, there's no, why wouldn't I just take what I want any way I could get it? Mm -hmm. But what, what, what's to hold me back? 
So once you become a demon, once you become less than human, once you become a member of a group that's beyond repair, yeah. that's the step we're very close to. Right. I think that's the disconnect, the fundamental philosophical disconnect for people that, that claim man is a sophisticated machine or just a more developed animal. You know, there's nothing really right. that distinguishes us from, from anything else. And, right. and, and if you, if you take that, but, but they'd probably be the first ones to say, but I, I want a moral ethic. Like I believe in human rights. I believe, right. you know, <laughs> right. right, right. Yeah. But why? So, yeah. Yeah, ultimately, these questions we're dealing with are pretty, yeah, they're kind of profound really, in terms of just how we, um, and there's nothing natural. Here's the other thing I think about a lot, Lexi, sometimes is there's nothing normal or pre, there's no, treating one another with the feeling that you want to do good to your opponent which is kind of, I believe, the essence of civility, not just manners, but you, you, you actually want to do good yes. to the person with whom you disagree. Mm-hmm. Um, um, there's nothing uh, inevitable about having that feeling. Mm-hmm. You know? We have to have institutions and ways of thinking and religious and philosophical uh, wisdoms yes. that, that, te- that, you know, it doesn't just happen by virtue of us being born. Um, and we can tear down those ways too. We can yes. tear them down. And I think we, we are, have we have tore them down in the past with World War Two. Yeah, yes. exactly. I think we are busily tearing down many of them. And so, what's going to be left after they're all gone? I, I, it's it's not a happy thing to think about. And you know, fortifying them, keeping them robust and strong. Um, these are institutions that, that are, pr- do promote, you know, humanity and, and human flourishing. They, the institutions themselves are insufficient. It, it, it is our everyday interactions, our relationships that, yes. that buttress them. And we know yes. this from the post-Soviet era where uh, after the, after the fall of the Soviet Union, liberal economists, free market economists and, and, you know, democratic um, political scientists went in and tried to erect these institutions, and, and we realized that you can't just airdrop a free market economy. You can't just um, airdrop checks and balances if you don't have a populace that's that actually trusts each other, that has these sort of the sort of you know tapestry of of, uh, of community that had been so corroded by by the system of communism that bred this mistrust and paranoia. Um, and so we know from that example, powerfully and viscerally, historically, that that the institutions alone will not sustain itself and that we need, we need a people that, you know, will, will fight for them. will will sacrifice yeah. for them in our everyday. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. James Madison said that democracy depends on a higher degree of virtue in the citizens than any other form of government. Mm-hmm. So, I love that. Yeah. It's kind of nice. You know, you can't, yeah, there's no there's no outside structure that will in a democracy especially it really depends on um, the people ha- having this inside them. I, I, I had a friend uh, he, uh, who said that when you have a king, the king's the authority. In a democracy, the king is fractured into a thousand little pieces, and everybody has to carry a little piece of, of the king within himself or herself. Interesting. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Who nice said that? Nice way to think about it. Who said that? Remind me. Oh, I, my friend of mine named David Gutman. He's an, a well-known anthropologist, and he's and the, it was just a nice way to put it. Yes. You have to carry around a little piece of the king inside you. That's yes. what self-government means. Right. There, there's, no, there's, no, there's nobody outside to govern you. It has to be you. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. You're, you're, you're in, it's self-governance. Self-governance. That's means right. Governing the self, the self-governing and governing the self. That's and so, right. That's so right. uh, it depends upon uh, these inward qualities that we used to, you know, we teach in Sunday school, we teach in kindergarten, but you would be hard pressed to see them on display in public life today. Right. Right. (laughs) It's true. 
It's true. <laughs> well, David, it's been a, a pleasure to, to chat with you. Um, these are really important issues and topics, and I think that the fact that your organization is dedicated to fostering conversation around them um, is so important. So 